Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We read from Luke chapter 2. Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Bethlehem, the town of David. He went up there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby. Keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those on whom this favor rests. Isaiah, chapter 52, beginning at verse 7. 
How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, for God reigns. Listen, your watchmen lift up their voices, together they shout for joy. When the Lord returns to Zion, they will see it with their own eyes, burst into songs of joy together, Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people, he has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord will lay bare his holy arm in the sight of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our song for this morning is Psalm 98D. It's on the screen or in your bulletin. After the organist introduces, introduces it, we will sing it together as a congregation. Flames of fire. 
But about the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
grace and mercy and peace come to us at Christmas every year. They're enjoying our gifts because of Jesus, God's Son, come to this world. And that's how we get those spiritual gifts, through Jesus, God's own Son. Our text for this morning, this, this Christmas message, is taken from the first lesson, just the first verse. We're just going to focus on, on Isaiah 52, verse 7, where Isaiah writes, How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. This is God's word. May we always learn and benefit from that word of God. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, our Lord and our newborn Savior, how beautiful are your feet? If I were to ask you to take off your shoes right now, and take off your socks, if I were to do the same, that's as far as I would get because my wife would stop me right there <coughs> because she knows my feet and she doesn't want to see them out in public. Feet are not the most generally pleasing of body parts. They're not generally the most beautiful of body parts. And, and we know that and, and God knows that. So what is God trying to say through Isaiah? He says, how beautiful are the feet of those who proclaim good news. What's God saying? He, he's talking about people who use their feet to go and spread good news, to share the good tidings of great joy, which is something that Jerusalem, at the time of Isaiah's writing, did not have a whole lot of. They did not have a whole lot of good news. They did not have a whole lot of great joy. They had forsaken their Lord over the course of generations and centuries. They had become spiritually bankrupt, spiritually immoral. But because God loved them, He wanted to restore them. And so He sent them prophet after prophet after prophet, urging them, encouraging, and pleading with them, come back to the Lord. Come back to the God who loves you so much. If you don't, there are going to be consequences. And so God gave them time. He was patient with them. So long suffering. But then finally, after a period, God says, I, I will not be mocked. And when they did not become serious about him, he became serious about his promise. And so he did destroy them. He sent a country, the armies of Babylon, of one of the mightiest fighting forces of the time, down to surround Jerusalem, and they destroyed it, they plundered it, and they took tens of thousands of captives out of Jerusalem, out of Judah, and to their captivity for the next 70 years. And again, that's what they did. They spent 70 years in exile as captives, not in their own homes, not in their own land. Nothing they had was theirs. That was the bad news that Jerusalem was dealing with at the time that Isaiah was writing these verses. Jerusalem had their share of bad news. I think you'd probably agree with them that you have your share of bad news as well, don't you? When you sit down at the dinner table, this afternoon or this evening, there's going to be somebody at every one of your families that you're going to be thinking of that's not there. Somebody. You'll, you'll be thinking of they're not there because they have gone to their eternal home in heaven this past year. Maybe it was a couple of years ago or many years ago, but you're going to be thinking about them. Are you not? Maybe they're not there because of a broken relationship. Maybe that's why they're not there around the dinner table. Those are some of the bad news things that we have to deal with. I have an old high school friend. <clears throat> she had a job, one job her whole life, her whole adult life since high school. She loved that job. It was the only job she ever wanted to have and ever wanted to do. This past year she lost that job, not due to her own, but it was a downsizing. She lost the job, job that she just absolutely love going to every single day. Heard recently that a pastor friend from Colorado who has two daughters. <clears throat> One daughter has been dealing with a terrible, debilitating, painful disease since the time that she was eight. They've been in and out of hospitals, children's hospitals for years, trying to help her, trying to help her deal with this 
disease for which there is no cure right now. Last week, they wrote that older sister, 13-year-old older sister now, had been having some terrible migraine headaches. She finally fell after about a week. She hit her head on the concrete. They took her into the emergency room and they diagnosed her with a brain tumor, a large brain tumor that is going to be very, very sketchy to deal with. And so now they're taking her down to Florida to see if they can deal with that. This is the second daughter of the family that has been having to deal with those kinds of bad news. A younger pastor friend, you probably heard about it because he was the son of this congregation back in October, driving to work as a pastor in Milwaukee, someone blows through a stoplight, T-bones him, and kills him. That family is going to be dealing with issues this Christmas. You deal with shut-ins. I, I make my regular rounds to shut-in visits during the Christmas week or the week before Christmas. And I'll tell you that most of them, almost all of them, did not have a whole lot of good to say about anything. Not a whole lot of smiles on their faces. Why? Wisconsin winters, Wisconsin storms, no sun. We've got sun today, but generally they have not seen any sun. Confined to their own homes where they are living, not able to get out, there's not a whole lot of good news in their minds. There's plenty of bad news to go around for everybody. That's just the stuff that I know about. I don't know what's going on in your lives at all. But bad news is not the final word, is it? If you're a Christian, if you come to church at all regularly, you know that bad news is not ever the final word. Go back to Isaiah's prophecy, the very last part of Isaiah's prophecy dealt with what? Not with your God is going to judge you. You're going to be destroyed. You're going to be going off into captivity for years. But the last part of Isaiah's prophecy said, God's coming back. He will bring you back as well. The Messiah will come. He will ransom. That's why we sing in Advent, O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel. Because Israel was in captivity in Babylon. And we're praying, or those Israelites were praying, God, come and return us back to our homes. Isaiah is saying that there is going to be a time when people, the people of Israel, are going to be running back home because they have been given the go-ahead to go back to their homes. And they're going to be running with beautiful feet. Because they've got good news to tell everybody else, guess what, we're coming home. We're just the beginning part, but everybody else is coming home. We've been in captivity for 70 years. We're coming home. And that was the good news that Isaiah was writing about. That's why their feet are beautiful. Now we have similar good news, and it comes not after a 70 year of captivity, but we have a, a good news that comes in a cyclical manner every single Christmas and every single Easter. We've got the good news that what has God come to do? To ransom us from the captivity that we have in sin. The Bible talks about being in bondage to sin, of uh, being slaves to sin, uh, of how we have nothing to look forward to in our life except for the consequences of sin, which is a terrible death in, in hell. God promised, however, way back when, the Garden of Eden already, that that would not be the end of the news. There was going to be another set of good news that God would come. His, his name is going to be Jesus because he's going to become God in a human being's body, living among us to be our substitute, to be our Savior. And this was the Messiah that was going to come to seek and to save the lost. And on that first Christmas night, that baby in Bethlehem, that son of Mary that we just sang about, was the good news. It's not news in itself, it's a person. Jesus is the good news. Don't put your hopes in the gods of Amazon or Apple or Samsung. Don't rely on the almighty dollar to give you the good news that you are looking for at Christmas. So many people fall for that. And they're happy for a time. For a tiny little bit of time. But they're not happy forever. 
Put your trust in the God whose promise is fulfilled in the babe in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one you really want. Jesus is the one that you really need. And he's coming this Christmas. Uh, a friend <coughs> the other day emailed me a little video that evidently has been around for 10 years. I've never seen it. It was called the Christmas Scale. How many of you have seen it? The Christmas Scale. Nobody? Good. Then nobody has to <coughs> critique my story. But here's the story. I'm going to try to summarize it from a three-minute video that I watched. It's an excellent story. If you want to follow the Christmas scale on YouTube when you get home today. It's the story of a young boy and his mother. The mother was a church organist for 37 years at her local church. And she wanted early on her son to have the joy of being able to play the piano. So she started him very early on on the piano. Here's the notes, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. Memorize those notes all the way up and down the 88 keys. Here are your scales. Here's a major scale, here is a minor scale. Here's the chord. She taught him theory. She taught him all the things that she thought that he would need to learn how to play piano. And as a boy, as most boys, probably every boy who has ever taken piano lessons does, she was getting sick of it until she came to him one day and says, you know something, the greatest news can be found in a scale on the piano. And he looked at her like, what are you talking about? The greatest news can be found in one little scale on the piano? And she says, yes, it's a C scale. So she told him to go over to the piano and play a C scale. So he went over and played the C scale. You know, I think I'm going to use a prop for the first time. <laughs> Here, here's the C scale that his mom told him to play. And he did that over and over, and he says, where's the good news in that? I've been doing that for, for a couple of years. Where, where's the good news? And she says, you got it backwards. Play a, a reverse C scale. So what he did. And he squinted his eyes and said, I still don't get it, Mom. Where is the good news? And she says, you forgot the pauses. Here's the pauses between the first, the second, the fourth, the sixth, and the, and the last notes. Play it with the pauses. And so we tried to play it with the pauses in the right places after those specific notes. And he finally got frustrated. He says, Mom, I don't get the good news. There's no good news in this scale that I'm playing. He got so frustrated that he just quit. I don't want to play piano anymore. It's not helping me. It's not doing anything for me. Years later, he's back. He's an adult now. And he's at the home of his mom, who had gotten sick and just passed away a couple of days before. And he's sitting in the empty house. He's remembering everything that he could remember about being a boy, growing up in that house, playing the piano. And then he saw the piano. And he says, you know something? My mom used to tell me that the greatest news in the history of the world could be found in a scale. And so he walked up, went over to the piano, and did it. And this time he even remembered the pauses. First, second, fourth, sixth, seventh, and after the last note. And then he played it the way that his mom told him.
peace of God which goes beyond our understanding will guard and keep your hearts here, minds in the true faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please stand. We confess our faith. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He ascended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. What does this mean? I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord. He has redeemed me a lost and condemned creature, purchased and won me from all sins, from death and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood, and with his innocent suffering and death. All this he did that I should be his own, and be delivered him into his kingdom, and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and justice. Just as he has risen from death, and lives and rules eternally, this is most certainly true.